Well, good morning everybody and welcome to your oceanography lectures number 21. So I'm gonna stop really quick just make sure that this is recording. I hope it is. Okay, it's recording. Just making sure, sorry. Um, but anyway, this is your tides lecture. So we'll do this two days and uh, we're gonna do this first one online, next one of course we'll be back uh, face to face. But anyway, uh, this is kind of a cool picture. It's just on the, the first slide here is the Bay of Fundy, which is in Nova Scotia, Canada. And you can see how extreme the tides are. You can see the people walking here during low tide, right? And then it gradually filling up. Whoops, this is, gosh, annoying. Okay. Gradually filling up until you get, you know, people kayaking around. So the tides there are really extreme, truly, truly extreme. They're like, they're like, I think 30... No, no, more, more than that, more like 50-foot tides. So <laughs> really extreme, right? 50-foot tides. So there you go. There's the Bay of Fundy, Nova Scotia during low tide versus high tides. So like I said, very, very extreme tides there. We're going to get into why that is in the next lecture. So uh, you'll have to kind of wait until, until that time to understand why this happens in Nova Scotia, Canada of all places, you know, because it's kind of random. Um, you'll see that tides are actually pretty complicated. Uh, depend on a lot of var variables. Here's a GIF showing the tides in Nova Scotia, Bay of Fundy. So you can see all the people walking around during low tide. Tides start coming in and it fills up very high, right? Very high indeed. There you go. The water is very brown probably because the tides are so extreme, the currents are so extreme, it's really kicking up a lot of water. So, uh, or sorry, kicking up a lot of sediment and that muddiness brown waters from the sediment in the water. So you can maybe get um, a sense with this GIF of how of how the uh, tides are actually like a wave. So I, I hope you remember from the last one that uh, the last lecture that we talked about waves, we talked about tides are actually like a wave and you should think of tides actually as a wave. And of course the wave length of the tide is actually half the circumference of the earth and the tide period or the wave period, sorry, it's about 12 hours. So we'll get into all the details about that today. But you can kind of see how it is, in fact, like a wave with this, right? With a crest and with a um, and a trough, just like a normal wave, right? So, you know, you can see, you can actually see it really here very clearly. Again, these, these are tides, uh, high tide and low tide. Uh, of course, this is over a period of a couple days here, right? You can see um, 8.22, okay, 12, going from 12 a.m., to there's another 12 a.m. and another 12. So this is over a period about a day and a half. And again, you can see how you have tides. You have a crest and a trough, right? A crest, crest and a trough. So uh, you can truly see how tides are in fact like a wave, right? So they have crests, they have tro troughs, they have periods, and they have a wavelength. And the wavelength is actually about right half the circumference of the Earth. Periods up to 12 hours long. And uh, tides get very complicated, so the periods are not always exactly 12 hours. Sometimes they're shorter. Sometimes they, they could be uh, actually six hours. Sometimes they can be even more than that. So, and we'll get on to all the differences and why there are differences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, sorry, I'm gonna check this one more time. I know I'm recording, but I wanna check, make sure that my microphone, okay, I'm picking, you picking me up, okay. This microphone's been kinda wonky lately. Okay, so, um, there are actually so many variables that affect tides. And the principal variable is the gravitational pull from the moon. That's variable number one. That's the thing that really affects the tides. Variable number two is the gravitational pull from the sun. And we'll also see um, the centrifugal force of the earth spinning also plays a big role too. So there are a lot of variables at play. There's actually, believe it or not, there's actually up to 45 variables involved in predicting the tides. They're very complicated. Um, <laughs> I mean, you can get a pretty good idea of what the tides are gonna be just based on the moon, the, actually the phase of the moon. But um, like I said, it's, it's, it's very complicated. It's, 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 not, it's not a simple thing at all. To predict it accurately and predict the wave height accurately, there's a lot of variables that come into play. So it's it's quite a science um, to understand these things perfectly. Okay, 
And of course, you know, we have a lot of interest in the tides because you can imagine how much tides affect economic commerce and, you know, all, uh, every, you know, so so much of society is affected by the tides, right? So much of the uh, ocean commerce is affected by tides. So it's an important thing. So, uh, like I said, the number one variable involved in the in the uh, tides and determining what the height of the tides are comes from the moon. So, uh, this Greek explorer, he's an oceanic explorer, mariner, um, Pythias was the first as far as we know, to recognize the relationship between tides and the phases of the moon. Okay, So he was one of the first to write about this and understand that tides are somehow connected to the phases of the moon. Pythias, by the way, actually explored all the way to, from, he's a Greek explorer, he actually explored all the way to Great Britain, or I mean, what is now Great Britain, right? The British Isles. So it's pretty, for, for that time, pretty uh, extreme uh, distances he was covering. So the next kind of big advance that came in understanding tides, you know, if, believe it or not, really most of, most of human history, all we knew about tides is that, yeah, they seem to be connected to phases of the moon. And that's all we can really say. Um, the first person to really come up with a very comprehensive theory of tides was, of course, this gentleman who I'm sure you know by now, Sir Isaac Newton. So this is in the age of kind of early age of enlightenment and he <laughs> did so many different things but among among his major contributions of course Isaac Newton uh, he developed the theory of gravity and developed a, a a mathematical model for gravity right so this is the model up here so gravity gravitational force the gravitational force is equal to g times mass 1 times mass 2 divided by R squared. So let me explain what all these variables are. So of course tides, like I said, are resulting from the gravitational pull of the moon on Earth's oceans and Earth's waters. And by the way, Earth's atmosphere as well. So uh, what is what is gravity? Well, gravity is just the force that uh, attracts. It's an attractive force between any mass and all mass. So every single atom of your body is currently being attracted to every single atom in the universe, right? Even the furthest, most distant stars are pulling a little bit on every single atom in your body. So, you know, same thing happens between the, the mass of the moon and the mass of the water in the oceans, okay? So the oceans are being pulled on by the mass of the moon. So this first kind of early attempt to explain tides it's known as equilibrium theory. So you see it written right here, equilibrium theory. Now, equilibrium theory uh, was a kind of a model of how the tides work. It's an idea about how the tides work based only on positions of the moon and positions of the sun and positions of Earth. Okay, so it was only astronomical factors being included. We'll see later with um, Laplace's dynamic theory that there are actually a lot of different variables. Like I said, there are 45 different variables. But for now, we're just going to consider equilibrium theory and the different the different factors there. Okay. So anyway, moving along. Oh, I forgot. Let me explain this. So, so gravitational force, like I said, gravitational force, you will not, don't worry, you will not be required to use this in your, uh, you know, final exam or anything like that. Uh, you're not going to have to use this, uh, but I do kind of want to explain how this all works. So the gravitational force is equal to G. Now this G, let me um, get rid of some of the ink on the slides here. Um, just give me a second. Okay, so this big G, so the gravitational force is equal to this big G. Big G is just a number, okay? It's it's simply a number. It's it's a it's a basic universal constant. It's a constant of the universe, right? It was set before the beginning of time. Okay, so uh, it's it's equal to I can't even remember. I think it's like six point six times ten to the negative eleventh power newtons per kilogram squared. But it, do, it doesn't really matter. You don't have to know the, the the value of it. You just need to know that it's a number. Don't worry about it. Um, then the gravitational force is equal to the mass of mass number one in kilograms, the mass of mass number two in kilograms, and the distance between them, r is the distance between them squared. So the basic idea is that gravity, gravitational force, uh, depends on how big the object is, but more than that, 
it actually depends doubly on how far away the, the objects are. So you're going to see that the gravitational force drops off with drastically with the distance between them. So you'll see this a lot with the sun. So the sun is a lot bigger than the moon, but the force that the moon exerts on our tides is greater. Why? Because it's just closer. That's why. Okay. Because because distance is more important than the mass in terms of force of gravity. Okay. All right. So gravitational pull. Uh, this is kind of is what I just explained to you. Okay. So it's all kind of spelled out there. Um, so the moon is going to be pulling on Earth's waters, and you can see that it makes kind of like a high tide here, right? And you'll notice one thing that's kind of odd is that there's also a high tide on the other side, and that's maybe a little bit weird, and you might wonder why that is, okay? Now you'll notice that the waters that are at like a 90 degree angle there are actually at their low tides, okay? So you see that there. Now, why is it, so maybe you can understand why there's a bulge right here, there's a tidal bulge right here, okay? Because the moon is pulling on that water, right? But why is there a tidal bulge over here? So this has to do, actually, we'll, we'll see this a little bit later, but this actually has to do with the centrifugal force of Earth's uh, spinning and its revolution around the sun. So the water is actually pulling out and bulging out on that side, because of the inertia of, of the Earth spinning. Okay, that's why. So um, this is just a GIF kind of showing equilibrium theory in, in uh, how it works. Okay, so you'll see that there's a certain tidal pull shown with the yellow of the solar tide. So that's the bulge created by the sun. And there's a larger bulge created by the moon. Okay. So you'll see that when all this, and actually what's happening is, you know, this GIF is a little bit misleading because what's really creating the day-to-day -day high tides is the spinning of the Earth, right? But the moon, of course, is orbiting the Earth, and that changes the position of the tides um, relative to the sun every month, okay? So you'll see this. It gets very complicated. So, you know, there are daily tides, there are daily fluctuations of the tides, there are monthly fluctuations in the tides, and there are yearly fluctuations in the tides, and there are actually fluctuations in the tides that are even beyond annual. They're, they actually go out and they're, uh, that have to do with changes in Earth's orbit around the sun and changes in Earth's rotational axis and all these things. So there are all these, <laughs> all these, like I said, astronomical variables that fall into determining the tides. Okay. So a little bit more about the Earth-Moon system. So it just kind of, because like I said, the Moon's the most important variable. And I just want to give you a little bit of background on how this all works, right? Because uh, we, we haven't talked too much, or I don't think at all, hardly about the Earth and the Moon uh, thus far. So um, <clears throat> as you know, we have a Moon. The Moon is 244,000 miles away. And uh, I always remember that because that's about how far you can drive a car before it totally, totally craps out. So uh, it's 244,000 miles away. And it is only a very small uh, body compared to us, right? It's uh, less than 5% of our mass. So it's, it's quite small. However, uh, you know that it orbits around the Earth, okay? Now the orbit of the moon around the Earth is what creates those beautiful phases of the moon, okay? And I'm sure you know some of those phases, some of them you might not know, but um, we start off every month, right? Now months, right? We, we, of course, we split up the year in, into 12 months, right? And the, the months are based off of what? Well, they're based off of the approximately 12 rotations of the moon, you know, the 12 rotations the moon does around the sun, around, around the earth every year, okay? So it takes um, 27.5 days for the moon to go completely around the Earth. However, it will actually take 29.5 days to actually see a complete cycle from new moon to new moon. And the reason is that is, is that we're actually rotating course around the sun at the same time that the moon is orbiting around us. So it, it, there's a slight change in the position of the Earth-Moon-Sun system at, you know, within the course of a cycle. So that's why you see a slight difference in the a number of days, which is, you can see 29.5, it's approximately one month, right? So we call that a synodic month. 
and a sidereal month is the actual time. Sidereal is right up here. A sidereal month is act the actual amount of time it takes for the moon to go around the Earth. Okay. Now um, you can see right over here on the on this side, the right side, that this is the rays of the sun coming in. Now the sun is so far away that the rays are coming in basically parallel. So uh, you could you could see that the the angle doesn't change right from the top of the diagram up here to the bottom. It's all coming, the light's coming in at the same distance. That's because the sun is so far away. Now, when the moon is between the sun and the earth, we call that a new moon. Now, if, you, it, if you've ever seen a new moon, well, there's something horribly wrong with that. If you saw a new moon, there would be something very, very wrong with the universe because you can't see it at all, right? Um, for one thing, the new moon is in front of the sun. So the only time, actually, that you would ever quote unquote see a new moon is during a solar eclipse okay otherwise the moon is very very close it would be very very close to the sun it would be dark and you wouldn't be able to see it so people don't really notice a new moon because you don't you don't really see it now from there the moon rotates counterclockwise around the earth if you're looking down on the earth's north pole it goes counterclockwise so what you would start to see is a very thin crescent moon that would rise very early in the morning and we call that a waxing crescent okay and you'll notice that the right side of the moon is illuminated here so the way to tell the difference between a waxing crescent and a waning crescent is that the left side of the moon is illuminated in a waning crescent the right the right side of the moon is illuminated during a waxing crescent then you get to a first quarter moon a lot of people call this colloquially they will call it I should say erroneously a half moon. There is no such thing as a half moon. Okay, don't call it a half moon. It's a quarter moon. And it's a quarter moon because it's a quarter of the way through its cycle. Okay, we don't call that a half moon, even though half of it's illuminated. But you can see in a first quarter moon, the right side of the moon is illuminated. So that's how you know it's a first quarter. Now, you'll notice that here it's at a right angle with the sun, right? So let me erase the ink on here. So, um, you know, you can see there's a right angle here now. Oh, I'm trying to draw a straight line, and it's not very straight. Okay, so there's a right angle. So actually what you'll notice is that this moon is at its peak, what's called the meridian point, uh, right, at, right at sunset. Okay, so this moon, uh, first quarter moon, will be at its highest point in the sky right at sunset, and then it will, it will go down, be below the horizon at midnight, and it will rise at about 12 noon. Okay, and what you'll notice is that as we go through the course of a month, the moon will rise at different points throughout the day. Okay, so um, people sometimes notice first quarter moons. Whoops, I actually did a mistake. People often notice first quarter moons. Um, people a lot of times also notice waxing gibbous moons. Okay, waxing gibbous moons are moons that are more than more than half illuminated, but not quite a hundred percent illuminated. So we call a waxing gibbous. And then we have a full moon. Of course, a lot of people, whoops, a lot of people notice full moons, right? So full moons are moons that are on the totally polar opposite side of Earth relative to the sun, okay? So now here comes the sunlight, right? And on the other side of the Earth is the full moon. Now the full moon is totally illuminated by the sun. So we, we see its face very clearly. It's very prominent. We notice it easily. It will rise exactly at sunset. And it will it will um, set exactly at sunrise. Okay. Then we go to a waning gibbous. You'll notice that the left side is now illuminated instead of the right side in a waning gibbous. And then we go to a third quarter. Third quarter is actually going to be at its meridian point right at um, sun sun sunrise, and it will set at about 12 noon in the afternoon, right? And then we go to a waning crescent. And finally, to a new moon. Okay, so that's that's the phases of the moon, and the tides are going to depend on the phases. So you never see a new moon. Um, the only ever time you see a new moon is when you you see it during a solar eclipse. Okay, so it's behind. Uh, so you just see it kind of behind the sun. So um, that's when, of course, the moon is in front of the sun. Now, because the moon's orbit is a little bit tilted relative to Earth. That's why you don't always see this kind of a moon. 
Okay. Well, I mean, I'm sorry. That's why you don't always see a solar eclipse. Okay. So actually, solar eclipses are pretty rare, and it has to occur. You know, it only occurs when when um, the uh, the uh, orbit of the moon around the Earth is in line with the ecliptic plane. Okay. And the ecliptic plane is the orbit of this of the Earth around the Sun. Okay, now there's a first quarter moon, right? It's going to be at its highest point at sunset, and it's going to rise at noon. It'll set at midnight. There's your full moon, okay, and it rises at midnight. Or sorry, it's at its meridian point at midnight. It rises at sunset, sets at sunrise. Um, you can see a full moon generally during the day, uh, you can, or you can't see it generally during the day, um, unless it's maybe the summertime and the days are especially long. And then you can see it um, during the day close to the horizon. Okay. Third quarter moon, um, people don't notice third quarter moons or waning moons as much because they're, they're out more during the night. Um, but it sets at noon, it hits the meridian at sunrise. And uh, you rarely see, it, well you do, but you'll see crescent moons once in a while. Usually it'll be when they're close to the, uh, close to the uh, horizon, either during sunrise or sunset. So like I said, the moon's orbit is tilted, average of 5.1 degrees relative to the, um, the Earth's ecliptic plane, okay? So this would be like a five degree tilt. So that's why we don't get solar and lunar eclipses every month. If we had, if we had, a, if we had no orbital uh, tilt of the moon, you would get solar and lunar eclipses every month, but that's why. So this, this orbit though actually changes. So it will, it will, it will kind of go through cycles where it tilts and the tilt changes. And um, so that's why we do sometimes get lunar eclipses and solar eclipses. Okay. Also, sometimes the moon will be closer. Sometimes it will be further away. So various, um, various parts or various uh, characteristics of its orbit do change. This is a kind of a time, time lapse photo showing how the orbit of the moon around the sun changes from year to year and, and sometimes decade to decade. Okay, so there's a bunch of cycles that change. I don't go into all those. If you ever took an astronomy class, you would, um, you would, you know, study all those things. So uh, now the Earth and the moon system, uh, of course, the moon is orbiting around the Earth, and it is kind of kept in place by the gravitational pull of, of, of um, the Earth to the moon. So the Earth is tugging on the moon, pulling it in, but the moon is also spinning around the Earth. And so that centrifugal force balances with the tug of the gravitational tug, the gravitational pull of the Earth. So you might wonder, at least I always wondered, like, if the Earth is pulling on the moon, why doesn't the moon just collide with the Earth and blow up like that, like this GIF is showing? I, I always kind of wondered that. And so, you know, because the, the Earth has this immense gravity, the moon has gravity, and uh, why, why don't they just collide like that, right? So the answer to that is there's some centrifugal force, right? So the moon is being pulled by the gravitational pull of the Earth, right? So it's being pulled by, I'm sorry for these little things that lash out like this. I have never been able to figure out why that happens, but it does, so I just have to live with it. But anyway, there's the, the gravity of Earth, okay? So that's one factor that's happening here. But there's also, because the moon is orbiting, you get this pull of inertia, and you get a um, centrifugal force, okay? Or sorry, that's the path of inertia, and that's the centrifugal force pulling out. So you'll notice that there are two forces, right, pulling on either side of, of the moon. There's a centrifugal force, and there's also the Earth's gravitational pull. And the same thing with the Earth. So the, on the Earth, there's going to be a gravitational pull from the moon, but there'll also be a centrifugal force, and that centrifugal force... Um, is going to what creates the tidal bulge on the other side of the Earth, opposite of the Moon. Okay. So, by the way, you don't have to know all these equations. Um, I'm just it, it's just up there. Um, it's just giving the the relationship between the force, the centrifugal force, and uh, the velocity. It depends on the velocity. It depends on the distance between the two objects, and it depends on the mass. Okay. So um, one thing that's kind of interesting that maybe you, you didn't realize is that um, the the moon doesn't the moon doesn't rotate around the center of the Earth. Actually, 
the earth and the moon are both kind of dancing almost they kind of almost look like dance partners don't they kind of like spinning around uh, they, they're actually both spinning around each other. So the Earth spins around the Moon in a sense, and the Moon spins around the Earth. Uh, and they actually both spin around their center of gravity. So that center of gravity is called the barycenter. And it's actually located inside of the Earth, but not at its center. So you can see the barycenter right here. And you can see that both the Earth and the Moon are actually rotating around that very center so so that's actually what's happening while the earth is simultaneously rotating around because actually what's rotating you know around the uh, Sun is the very center okay so so the earth is doing these cycles orbitals around the moon in a sense or at least not around the moon per se but around the very center the, the their center of mass so um, just kind of FYI that happens too so here are some more pictures of the Barry Center from a top view. So on, so this top picture is showing kind of a top looking down view of the Earth and the Moon, and then the um, this is a side view down here. So, just thought you might want to know that. So why are there tidal bulges on both sides of Earth? That's a good question because right, the Moon's gravitational pull is creating this high tide over here. But why is there also a high tide bulge over here? Well, that has to do with the centrifugal force um, being generated by Earth's rotation and its orbit around the moon. Okay, So um, there are actually two, two tide generating forces. There's the gravitational force of the moon and sun and or sun. And there's centrifugal force. So you can see that um, here's the sun's attractive force. And you could put sun or moon. You could maybe put sun or moon either one um, or both, right? And then there's centrifugal force. So the centrifugal force is always pointing directly outward, right? It's always pointing directly outward. But then at the same time, you'll notice that I want, I want you to point, I want to, I want you to notice something here. The, the gravitational pull of either the sun or the moon is maybe a little bit off kilter. Okay. And that's because let's say you have the moon here. I'm going to draw on the moon right here, right? The gravitational pull is towards that, okay? So you can see the gravitational pull going towards that. So um, they, so what's kind of interesting is that centrifugal, centrifugal force and uh, the gravitational force do not, they're not like equally aligned and perfectly aligned to like counterbalance each other. So you'll actually end up with this this net force called the tractive force, okay? Tractive force is the combination of gravitational pull and centrifugal force. So when you, if I were to add up this arrow and this arrow and add them both together and combine them, I'd end up with, an, with another arrow that is going in neither direction, right? It's not going parallel to gravitational. And it's not going parallel to centrifugal. Gosh, I hate it when it does that. It's not going parallel to um, centrifugal force. Okay, so anyway, um, I hope that makes sense. But you'll notice that tractive force—it's the net force. It's gravitational pull plus the centrifugal force. When you combine them together, you end up with this tractive force. Okay, and the tractive force is actually the force that is moving the tides. Okay, and and I, again, I'm just pointing out that. It's the tractive force is not in the same direction as, as gravitational pull or centrifugal force. It's in an entirely new direction, and that occurs when you add those two forces together. Okay, um, I'm sorry if that doesn't make much sense, but it 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 has to do with forces. And if you haven't had a class in physics, maybe it doesn't make too much sense. But um, just suffice to say, I think it's enough for this class to understand that tractive force is just the, the, the net force, the added together combined force of gravitation and centrifugal force, okay? And that's the, that's the comb combined force that is gonna be the major player in determining the tides, okay? So um, this slide, it's just, this is uh, just kind of a summary slide of um, everything that we've been talking about up to this point. I only kind of included it here because it's, it's just a good summary of everything we've, we've learned so far, okay?
So I'm not going to go over everything here because I've already talked about it. I just wanted to have it all kind of put, pulled together in one slide. Um, one thing I also wanted to talk about that's kind of interesting is that there are actually quote unquote tides in our atmosphere too. And the moon is not just pulling on the water, um, it's also pulling on the gases of our atmosphere and it's going to create kind of bulges in our atmosphere. So this GIF that you see here is actually showing the red is showing um, kind of like an abnormally thick atmosphere. The blue is showing abnormally um, abnormally low atmosphere. And so that's actually going to – actually, I don't know if you've ever noticed this. Um, if you look at – I don't know if you <laughs> probably, – probably some of you like to follow weather a little bit, but I don't know, maybe not. But if you ever look at um, – this is the 10-day forecast down here for Corpus Christi. And this is – this black line down here is the atmospheric pressure. Okay, so this is atmospheric pressure. And you, you'll notice that there are actually – it goes up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down with the days, right? It's like a wiggly line going up and down. Well, those little ups and downs created in the pressure, the air pressure, it's actually coming from these tidal – "Quote unquote tidal forces, atmospheric tides. So the tide, you know, the pressure is going to go up and down a little bit every single day, because the pressure is going to build up as the atmosphere gets thicker during a high quote unquote high tide, and lower during quote unquote low tide. Tides, of course, we we always refer to always refer to oceans, but I'm just kind of using it as a proxy for this term, atmospheric tides. Okay. So anyway, just thought you might want to know that's a little interesting. Um, so tidal bulges, let me get, why is there a little, okay, there it is. So again, uh, we have two forces producing those bulges, right? We have the centrifugal force pulling out, pulling away from the moon, and then we have the gravitational pull of the moon. I already mentioned that. I don't know why I put that slide there. It really should be at the, before that. So um, also another thing I wanted to mention, um, this GIF kind of showed, why does this thing keep showing up? Isn't that weird? So, uh, so, um, what do you call it? So buggy. PowerPoint is, I mean. Okay, um, this is a pretty good GIF too. There's a lot, of, there's a lot of good tidal GIFs. Uh, but it kind of shows why and how tides are changing. So, this is showing the tidal bulges. Now, notice that the tides are actually changing not day to day due to the rotation of the earth right so it's not that the moon is rotating around earth and creating different tidal bulges in different places it's that that earth is rotating kind of um below the tidal bulge but of course the location of the tidal bulge changes as the moon goes through its orbit right so you're going to see the tidal bulges occurring at different points throughout the day because, I mean, basically you're going to see the tidal bulges occurring at different points throughout the day because the moon is going around the Earth, okay? So um, one thing I wanted to point out here is that the moon is simultaneously moving in the same direction as Earth's rotation. The same only has one E. I have to correct that. Um, it's Earth's rotation. So, by the way, it actually takes 24 hours and 50 minutes to complete a, a tidal cycle, Okay. So just like a synodic month is different than a sidereal month, so a tidal day is different than like our normal mean solar day. Okay, so a tidal day is the time it takes to complete an entire tidal cycle, high tide to high tide, um, and it's it's going to it's actually going to be 24 hours and 50 minutes. Okay, and that's because the moon is simultaneously spinning around the Earth as we spin below the tidal bulges. Okay, so besides the moon, uh, I mentioned also the sun creates tidal bulges as well. Now we call those solar tides. So we call tides from the sun lunar solar tides. We call tides from the moon uh, lunar tides. Okay. Now solar tides are a thing too. So uh, Earth is, <laughs> I kind of like this picture because it shows you how tiny we are relative to the sun. So you can see the tiny little Earth there relative to the sun. And you can see our moon is even tinier. Look at this, it's just a little speck, right? Um, so the sun is 27 million times larger than the moon, but it's also 387 times further away. 
So because uh, tractive force falls off with the cube of distance, um, 387 cubed is 58 million. So 27 million divided by 58 million gives you 46%. So the, the tractive force, solar, basically the, the force that's moving solar tides, it's only 46% of that of lunar tides. Okay, so, so solar tides are much smaller than lunar tides. Now, also remember that Earth's tilt is 23.5, so that means that the latitude of the solar tidal bulge is going to shift over the course of a year. So you'll have, during the summer, you're going to have a, a tidal, a maximum solar tidal bulge that's centered around the tropics, right, like the tropics of Cancer. But then in the winter time, it, that's going to shift, right, and then, and then you're going to have a maximum tidal bulge that's over the Tropic of Capricorn in the south. Okay, so all these little astronomical variables are playing a role to determine how big the tides are in different places, in different locations over the Earth. All right, so the combination of forces of solar tides and lunar tides create two kinds of tides that we'll see throughout the course of a month. So during one month, we're going to see... Uh, two periods of something called a spring tide and two periods of something called a neap tide. Okay, uh, A solar tide and a lunar tide, when they are aligned, so when the sun and the moon and the earth are in line, you can see they're in line, whoops, you can see how they're in line here, that creates a spring tide. And that's happening because the forces of the sun and the moon are adding together and kind of magnifying each other. So you end up with a relatively higher tractive force, a maximum tractive force, and a, a maximum tide. Okay, so we call those high, very high tides, very kind of more extreme tides, we call those the spring tides. Now you'll get a minimum in the size of the tides when the moon is at a 90 degree angle with the sun. And that's because the low tide is kind of being bulged out by the solar tide, and the the high tide is kind of being offset by the by the by the um, sun. So you end up with a a smaller um, a smaller change in the tidal the tides. Um, we call that a, a neap tide. So that happens during a first quarter moon and a third quarter moon. Okay, and it's when we have a 90 degree angle. Okay, so we either have spring tides or we have neap tides. Okay, neap means that it will not be as extreme high or lows, and spring means we'll have the most extreme highs and lows. And so these are cycles that we're going to see on a monthly cycle, on a monthly um, basis. Okay, so again, I keep saying this, but you know, we're going to go through monthly changes. We're going to go through, of course, daily changes. We're going to go through monthly changes. We're going to go through annual changes like I already talked here about how the location of the solar tidal bulge will be different based on the season so we'll go through annual changes and we're going to go through even changes that are beyond annual you know as as because there are different factors of our uh, orbit Earth's orbit around the sun and moon's orbit around earth that change from decade to decade century to century year to year. Okay, there are different things that change. So there's all these cycles that are playing uh, playing a role. Okay, so there's another GIF. So like I said, so many good tidal GIF, um, tide, or GIFs about tides. So I included a lot of them here. So you got a spring tide during a uh, full moon and a new moon, and then you get a neap tide during a first quarter and a third quarter moon. So um, this is kind of showing tidal ranges of a spring tide. So you can see there's the high tide of a spring tide and the low tide of a spring tide, and they're more extreme than those of neap tides. So neap tides are when you have first and third quarter moons. And just again, to let you know, um, <clears throat> here in Corpus Christi, we have already very low tides. I mean, we don't have a very, well, I shouldn't say low tide, but we have very low tidal ranges. So during neap tides in Corpus Christi, boy, you know, there's not much tidal flow. Not much tidal flow at all. So uh, you can see spring tides are shown. This is like, so where is this? This is Vancouver. 
um, and you're seeing kind of spring tides being highlighted and neap tides. And again, it's just showing how um, comparing it with the, the phase of the moon, right? You can see during new moon and a full moon, you get these spring tides. During a first quarter and third quarter moon, you get these neap tides. And the tidal ranges decrease during neap tides compared to spring tides. Okay. Um, I like this figure too. Uh, again, this is just showing, I keep emphasizing that you see these daily, monthly, yearly, and even beyond that changes and cycles in the tides. So this is showing tidal range tides over one day in Seattle. Okay, so you can see here's a low tide, a high tide, a low tide, a high tide. Um, so it actually has two high tides during the course of a day. Those are called semi-diurnal. Semi um, tides, we're going to talk about those in a minute. But you also see that tidal ranges change over the course of, you know, a month. And then you can also see this large scale pattern over the course of a year, right? You can maybe kind of see how there's sort of this dip, very subtle, but there's a dip right there. And then it, it grows again, right? So, so um, hopefully you can see something like that, right? So there you kind of go through a dip right here in the extremes of the tides. And this is over the course of a year, right? You can kind of see there's 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 a pattern here, there's a cycle here. So um, there's all these cycles, right? And it's the, the different time ranges for the cycles. Um, another thing that again is affecting the tides, that is, is something that is occurring on kind of a, a monthly basis is something called the um, apogee and the perigee. So just like you might remember, I did talk about this a couple times in class, but you might remember there's something called the aphelion and perihelion. That's when the distance between Earth and the Sun is either at a maximum or a minimum. And that's because Earth's orbit around the Sun is not a perfect circle. Okay, so we're not at a perfect same distance around the Sun at every single point during the year. Our orbit around the Sun is an ellipse. So you'll notice the same is true for our orbit or moon's orbit around the Earth. It's an ellipse. So sometimes it's going to be closer. That's called the perigee. That's it's going to be 225,000 miles away. And then there's an epigee, which is 251,000 miles away. The average is about 240,000 miles. Okay. So um, when the moon is at the epigee, um, the epigee point, it's going to be. Uh, kind of lower, relatively lower tides. And then when you have, so lower tidal ranges, and when you have the perigee, then you get the opposite. You're gonna get relatively higher tidal ranges because these, remember the moon is closer. And when the moon is closer, remember that, boy, gravitational force really depends a lot on distance. So even that small change in the distance is gonna, is gonna make for a big change in the tides. So that's why how we get kind of monthly changes to the tides as well, okay? So what's kind of interesting is that you'll notice that one spring tide might not be as big as another spring tide. So one spring tide might be larger than the other spring tide, or, or one maybe one neap tide will actually be bigger than the other neap tide, the tidal ranges, I mean. Why? It's because the moon might be at its perigee or epigee, okay? Um, you can actually detect this, so um, the moon will actually appear smaller or bigger. And you'll notice, I'm sure some of you notice, you'll be like, gosh, the moon looks big today, right? Gosh, the, you know, and uh, the reason for that maybe is because it's either at its perigee or epigee. And that happens, right, over the course of a, a month. And like I said, that's very equivalent to, very analogous, I mean, to the aphelion and perihelion, how the Earth is going to be at different distances from the sun over the course of a year. Okay. So all these things that we have talked about thus far are all something called astronomical tides. So they are the tidal changes that occur because of astronomical variables, right? We've talked about so many things so far, you know, the distance of the moon from the sun, or sorry, distance of the moon from the earth, the distance from the sun from the earth, you know, that's going to play a role in the size of the solar tides. Uh, the, the, of course, the phases of the moon. Uh, so, I mean, just so many things we've talked about. Um, and, you know, what's amazing is that that's really only a part of the puzzle. One part. So astronomical, t astronomical tides are just part, one part of tides in general. Okay. 
um, there are other factors that come into play. So Newton's, uh, Isaac Newton, going back to Isaac Newton, his equilibrium theory only really took into account astronomical tides. No, no other variable was included or talked about. I'm going to check my, um, check to see how I'm doing here on uh, time. Okay, I'm at 45 minutes, so let me cover a little bit more here, and then, uh, and then I'll knock off. So, uh, I wanted to show you this. This is pretty amazing. So, this is a map. Kind of just look at this and soak this in for a minute. This is a map showing tidal ranges in different places over Earth. And so you'll notice, like, around Great Britain... Where's my... Here it is. Around Great Britain there, really high ones. So remember I said the Bay of Fundy right there, Nova Scotia. Very big, right? Um, there's some in Hudson Bay that are very big. Okay. Here's some in Argentina, right? And tip of South America, Patagonia, that are very large. Then you can see there are some places the tides are very small. Look at the, here in Corpus Christi, right? In our Gulf of Mexico, we have very small tides, very small tidal ranges. Okay, there's some points in the ocean where there is no tide at all. Absolutely no tide. Mediterranean is very very low tidal ranges. Here in uh, Sea of Japan, very low tidal ranges. So I just want you to kind of look around at this diagram. Try to like, does it make any sense? It's kind of crazy because you know you would think from. This is what I'm trying to I'm trying to get you all to realize. I know that you're looking at this and you're like, but this looks so like I don't get it. Why? Why do you have high tides here and there and seems almost random and what i'm trying to point out to you is that yeah it's it's it, it looks kind of random to you probably right now because there's a lot more in determining the size of tidal ranges than just astronomical tides because if it was just astronomical tides it was just the position of the sun and the moon and the earth you would get something more regular right but there are a lot of other things that affect the tides besides the sun and the moon and the earth, right? Um, locations of the sun and the moon and the earth and just astronomical variables. So there are other things that affect it. Like for example, you might notice that in all these kind of enclosed seas, or not, I shouldn't say all of them, but a lot of them, there are very low tides. Like look at this, the Sea of the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, very low tides. In the Sea of Japan, very low tides. In the Mediterranean, very low tides, right? Um, so you, you might you might kind of get the picture from that, you know, that in the Red Sea there are very low tides, right? So you kind of might get the picture from that that um, you know maybe the the continents are playing a role here as well, and the shape of the ocean basin is playing a role, and that's true. So when we start to take other factors into account. Uh, we end up with something called the dynamic theory. Okay, so dynamic theory. So dynamic theory is a theory that was developed a little bit later by uh, a Frenchman, Laplace. And uh, it actually took into account a lot of different things. So it took into account the imperfect shape of the earth, right? The seasons, the sh various shapes of ocean bases, the Coriolis effect, and other things too. Like I said, there are actually 45 total different variables that affect tides. So there's a lot of things that we could account for. And, and we'll see how some of these things um, play out. And it gets very, it's very, it's very complicated. This, I want to show you, this is a GIF showing um, tides over the course of a day. And it's, look at it. It's, take some, take some time to look at this because it's, it's pretty surprising. Take a look at, how high tides are changing. And, you know, if it was just astronomy, you would maybe just kind of expect the tides to sort of rise and like almost like a straight line sweeping across the earth, right? But there's a lot of other variables that come into play here, right? There's, there's fluid dynamics. 
there's the, the shape of the ocean basins, the location of the continents, it's the, the different sh uh, imperfect shape of the Earth. You know, Earth isn't a perfect circle. Um, here's the Coriolis effect. There's, there's um, we'll see that Seiche waves play a big role here too. But uh, I know this seems like, wow, this is, seems so random um, looking at this. And I remember the first time I saw this, I was like, uh, I can't make any sense of this. Why, why is it moving the way it does? So anyway, um, we're going to explain all these things and why it happens the way that it happens. Okay. So tides, um, part of the key here is to remember that tides, again, they're like large waves. They have, they're like waves with extreme wavelengths and dynamic theory takes this into account that, uh, tides in the ocean are going to behave kind of like a wave. So by the way, this is, this is actually a tidal bore. Um, this is a true tidal wave. So, uh, that's what, that's what a real tidal wave looks like. So, um, if the tidal bulge is a wave, uh, I want you to, I want you to kind of think about this a little bit. So I keep saying, yeah, tides are a wave, tides are a wave, tides are a wave. Um, but think about what that means. So if the tidal bulge is a wave, um, one question we could ask is, well, how fast is that wave moving? Because you might remember in the last lecture, we spent a lot of time talking about how fast waves move. Now, what are some of the factors uh, we talked about when we talked about waves moving through the water? So hopefully you can kind of bring some of those things to mind. So remember I showed you this uh, lecture slide last time and we talked about the speed of an ocean wave well remember how we said well it depends um, how fast does an ocean wave move well it depends it depends if it's deep water or if it's shallow water and remember that we de we defined deep water and shallow water based on the wavelength right lambda it's the wavelength uh, divided by two so if 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 the wavelength divided by two if the depth of the water is greater than the wavelength divided by two, then we treat it as a deep water wave. If not, we treat it as a shallow water wave or a transitional wave, okay? Now, um, you can remember that we have two different formulas for the velocity of a wave based upon whether it's a deep water wave or if it's a shallow water wave. So a shallow water wave is gonna depend just on the depth of the water. A deep water wave is gonna depend um, on other things. So you might remember that if, the, if we think of this as a wave, okay, if we think of, if we think of the um, tide as a wave, well, what's the wavelength in this case? Well, if it's a wavelength, it would be, you know, the wavelength of it would be um, half the circumference of the earth, right? So half the circumference of the earth is, right, like 12, I can't, re can't even remember really what it is. It's, it's uh you know, it would be, oh, I guess it would be six, 6,000 kilometers, right, times times two, times pi, right? Well, I guess I divided by two to get half, but, you know, suffice to say, it would be, it would be like probably 18,000 kilometers, right? So, obviously, we can't have a deep water wave, because the oceans are not 18,000 kilometers deep. They're like four kilometers deep, right? So, so this is my point. Um, I, I just kind of want to, I just kind of want to bring this up. I hope I'm not confusing you too much. I'm sorry if you're just totally confused by all the math, but this is what I want to bring up. The earth is spinning really fast, right? And it's 440 meters per second at the equator. So it's spinning real fast. So the tidal bulge, uh, is going to be, should be moving really fast, or at least the forces that the, the tide, tidal bulge is reacting to are going to be moving very fast. However, this is going to be kind of the, the speed that the water can actually rise and move, the speed at which this tidal wave can move across the water is, is hampered by the depth of the water because it's a shallow, it's going to behave as a shallow water wave. It can't, it can't behave as a deep water wave. So we can't really because it depends on the depth of water and shallower waters, it's going to be harder, much, much harder for the wave to kind of keep pace 
with the tidal bulge, if that makes sense. So if, if that's too complicated for you, just at least understand this. There's going to be a, there's, the, the tidal forces are going to be moving faster across the surface of the earth than the, than the depth of the water will allow. Okay, because remember that shallow water waves are kind of kept in check. Their velocity, there's a speed limit to its velocity that depends on the depth. And, you know, the, the, just waves in water can't move, can't move very fast in shallow water. You just can't have waves that move very fast in shallow water. Okay, so this is my point. Um, there's going to be kind of a time difference between the location of the tidal bulge um, there's kind of going to be like a delay because it's, it's the tidal bulge can't move very fast through as fast as it wants through our relatively shallow oceans. OK, so that's one factor that comes into explaining why we get these kind of strange patterns to how how um, tides rise and fall across the globe. OK, so that's one part of dynamic theory. So uh, waves created by tides, we actually call these driven waves. So they're not free moving waves. Um, they're actually being driven, kind of artificially caused to rise from these, from these uh, gravitational forces. Okay, now another thing that affects, remember I told you, you're gonna see this Seitch wave uh, GIF a lot. So um, another thing that comes into play here is the shape of the ocean basin. So, oh, I guess I actually do explain this whole Bay of Fundy thing. I guess let me explain um, explain this, and then uh, probably will be time to knock off. But um, remember that Seitch waves are kind of like sloshing back and forth in an ocean basin. So what can happen is that the um, the sloshing back and forth. So you can have a tide, you know, make it maybe it makes like a high tide, and it'll it'll cause this sloshing back and forth in the basin. And so what will actually happen is that um, you'll get a something called semi-diurnal tides. Semi-diurnal semi tides occur when you have two high tides throughout the course of a 24-hour day. Okay, You might say, like, well, how on earth can you get two high tides? Well, the first high tide is from is from the tidal bulge, the normal tidal bulge um, that are, you know that results from the moon, but the second high tide is actually the water sloshing back in the basin. So, like I said, imagine, you know, imagine, imagine this: the water, the the water sloshes, you know, it rises on one side due to the tidal bulge, and then it hits the other side of the basin and it surges back, right? And that's a that's a Seisch wave. So the second high tide is not actually from the lunar gravitational pull. This is actually resulting from the Seisch wave that is kind of bouncing back. So again, go go over here and look at this again, this GIF again. Okay. So let's say so let's say that it originally rises over here due to the lunar lunar pull, right? And then it'll cause this sloshing in the basin. The wave will go back this way and it'll come back, right? And it will it will rise for a second time. So they get a first high tide, second high tide, and that second high tide is really just the Seisch wave. It's just the Seisch wave that's returning back to the shore. So you'll end up in some places uh, with semi-diurnal tides, and some places you'll get diurnal tides. So um, this is what a, this is over a, the course of a day. This is kind of like what you would maybe normally expect from just pure astronomical tides, you would expect a diurnal tide. Okay, so by the way, notice that this is this is a, a two day period. Okay, so one day is here. And then the second day is here. So you would notice one, you should get one high tide a day. Okay. But notice that with um, semi diurnal tides, you're actually getting multiple high tides a day, two low tides and two high tides a day. So and that's because of Seisch waves. Okay. Some places are in the shape of the ocean basin is such that you get a mixed tide. So sometimes you get a diurnal tide, sometimes you get a semi-diurnal. It kind of depends on, 
on kind of the shape of the or maybe you get you know two low tides and you get one high tide or two high tides and one low tide so we call that a mixed tide now if you look at the distribution of mixed tides versus semi diurnal tides versus diurnal tides um, you'll see that the larger the basin is where you get semi diurnal tides so so you can see that like the the places that are on like the shore of the um, Atlantic or Pacific, a lot of those places are getting diurnal tides, or I'm sorry, semi-diurnal tides. So you're getting like two high tides per day, two low tides per day. Notice in Corpus Christi, we get diurnal tides, okay? And that's because our basin, the Gulf of Mexico, is too, sl is too small to kind of generate a big seish wave. So, um, you'll notice that like on the shores of the Pacific and the Atlantic, that's where you get more of the semi-diurnal tides. And it's because you have a big basin where you can generate a big seish wave and um, it'll create something. You know, we, and we do get seish waves, of course, in the Gulf of Mexico, but uh, they're just so small we don't really notice them. So Corpus Christi, we're gonna be diurnal, diurnal tides. And you'll notice that we're kind of in the minority there, right? See, most places around the world, you'll notice get either mixed tides or semi-diurnal tides. So um, here's just, uh, I go to my favorite fishing website to look at the tides. And of course, if you fish, and I know some people in our class, of course, fish, uh, you know, you look at the tides a lot because because uh, it makes a big deal. And this, so this is showing the, the tides in Corpus Christi over the course of um, over the course of a day. So I took this on November 17th. So here's a question for you. Is this a diurnal tide or a semi-diurnal? And you should notice that we only have uh, one low tide and we have one high tide, right, um, during the course of this day. So we call this a diurnal tide, which makes perfect sense because like this map, we saw that Corpus Christi is a diurnal tide. Um, another thing I wanted to show you, here's the moon on that day. It was a waxing gibbous. So what do you think? Is this going to be a like a spring tide or a neap tide? So um, this is going to be closer to a spring tide. So again, you can see that the tidal heights are pretty low. You know, like <laughs> look at the difference between low tide and high tide during, you know, what is mostly a spring tide. Um, it's still pretty low. So Corpus Christi, we get pretty relatively low tides and we also get um, diurnal tides. So you should know that for the test, because I'll, I'll ask you a little bit about that, especially about whether, what do we get, what do we get, what kind of tides do we get in Corpus Christi, okay? So anyway, that's, uh, I'll keep it here for now, and we'll continue the rest later. But I uh, hope you have a good day, hope you have a good Thanksgiving, and I will see you when I get back. And from there, I'll talk to you later. Whoops.